O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. The image of Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is perhaps the most common picture for our Lord Jesus in all of Scripture. That is the way that Christ was pictured for the children of Israel as year after year they would bring lambs up to the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. A few minutes ago, we heard one of the great prophetic pictures of our Savior Jesus picture of Jesus as the Lamb of God who carried our sins and bore our sorrows. The entire New Testament again and again uses that picture of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. From John the Baptist's joyful announcement, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To the Apostle Peter's proclamation in his letter that we have been ransomed not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That picture of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is a common one throughout all of Scripture. And for that reason, it shouldn't surprise us at all that in the last book of the Bible, a portion of which is before our eyes this morning, we see Jesus pictured as that Lamb of God who was slain. As you know what the truth of the matter is, you and I, we ought to find special comfort and joy in the fact that there in the glory and bliss of heaven, there in that place where Jesus is triumphant and victorious, even there, he wants us to see him as the lamb who was slain. And through the Apostle John, our Savior Jesus, gives us three reasons why we draw comfort from this fact that the Lamb of God has been slain for us. The first of those reasons why we find comfort in the fact that Jesus is the Lamb who has been slain has to do with that scroll that Jesus talks about in Revelation chapter 5. We heard earlier, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And, be, and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now at first glance, this, this seems like one of those parts of the book of Revelation that makes Christians a bit intimidated to read that book of the Bible. I mean, John talks here about a scroll, but he doesn't explain to us what this scroll means, how we're to understand it. However, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, the difficulty in understanding that scroll quickly disappears. The very first book of the, or the very first verse of the book of Revelation tells us that this entire book, from beginning to end, is a revelation that Jesus gave to his church to tell his people what is going to happen in the future. And when you and I think about the future, it's, it's very clear, very obvious. We don't know what the future holds. We can't look into it. Yeah, people try to make predictions about the future, but, but we know how uncertain those predictions are. They're just as likely to be false as they are to be true. That future is something that is sealed to our eyes. And from the fact that, that John talks about this scroll as something that was sealed, that no one in heaven or earth has the right or privilege to look into, that ought to go a long way in helping us to understand that this scroll is what we might call the book of future history. Now when we think about that future, when we think about what lies ahead for us, a lot of times thoughts about the future can make us worried and anxious. The future can give us a, a sense of dread at times, or sadness. I would imagine there are some of you sitting here today who at one point or another have worried about the future. You've worried about how you're going to take care of yourself or your family because maybe you've lost a job. 
Or maybe at some point work was slow and you didn't know when the next paycheck was going to come through. And you worried. Those of you who are parents, no matter what age your kids are, I would imagine every one of you has worried about your children and their future. Will my children find, find spouses? Will they find good jobs? Will they have health? If you're single, have you ever feared, will I stay alone for the rest of my life? Will there be anyone to help me or to care for me when I get older? When you and I think about the future and all of the uncertainties that that future is filled with, it's easy for us to react the same way that John reacted when he saw that sealed scroll, to weep, to be worried, and to be anxious. But what was John told? He was told the driest tears. One of those elders said to him, Weep no more, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. When you and I look at the future and feel uncertainty, when you and I think about what lies ahead for us in this life, and, and we're worried and anxious, then we ought to pause and we ought to remember that Lamb of God, Jesus, who holds the future. In fact, it is because that Lamb of God, Jesus, has been slain, that he has the right to open that book of the future and to tell us what is inside. He has that right because by his death, he has written our future. He has written the future for you, for you of eternal life in heaven. And every day of that eternal life in heaven has been written in the indelible red ink of his blood. That future that you have is this. For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There is nothing uncertain about the future that you and I have, thanks to that blood of Jesus. Because he has been slain. We have the certainty of a future life in heaven. And everything on this earth, both good and bad, must serve to bring us to that eternal home in heaven. But it is not just a certain future that gives us comfort when we think about this lamb who has been slain. There is a song of praise sung to this lamb. And that song of praise, it gives us a second reason why this lamb gives us comfort. That song of praise said, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. There is a problem you and I have that is, is even worse than uncertainty about the future. This worst problem is the problem of sin and its result of death. That is a problem every one of us was born into, and it is a problem that remains with us all our lives. People are very good at ignoring those problems of sin and death. People are very good at trying to avoid thinking about them. But there are some times when we just can't ignore those problems of sin and death. When you're sitting at a funeral and there's a casket right in front of you, you can't ignore death. You can't escape its reality. When you've let someone down, when you've hurt someone that you love, betrayed their trust, and there's that knot of guilt down in the pit of your stomach that just kind of gnaws away at you, you can't escape the reality of sin, no matter where you go or how you try. But the truth is, it isn't just when we feel that reality of sin and death that it's a problem. Sin and death are a reality all of the time. And the cross makes the reality of sin and death inescapable. There at that cross, we see the real cost of sin and death. It takes the blood of God himself to fix this problem. But there on that cross, there
there and that lamb who has been slain in his blood. You and I, we are ransomed for God. What an incredible picture. Jesus has bought us back from sin and death. Just think about that. There you and I were. We were under this crushing burden of debt, a debt that we could never repay, not even with all eternity. And along comes Jesus. And he sees us under that burden of debt. And he says, I'll take care of that. But sin says, wait. Wait just one moment. Death is required to pay this debt. And so Jesus says, here, I'll die. I'll hang on that cross. And sin says, sin says, wait. Every penny of this debt must be paid, and it must be paid in blood. And so Jesus says, here. Here, grab those hands, those nails into my hands. And drop by drop, he pays for your salvation and my salvation. Jesus endured the loneliness and the abandonment that our sins deserve. And he did it so that you and I would be purchased for God. So that we would be part of his family and never be abandoned or alone again. We would belong to the perfect and ultimate family. Those chains of our debt. Chains that you and I could never break. That we could never unlock. Jesus unlocked them with that perfect payment. No longer are you a prisoner to the fear of death. No longer are you a slave to sin. Instead, thanks to that lamb that has been slain, you are a king who has conquered death. You are a priest who has been set free from sin to serve God. What a marvelous comfort we have. Because our lamb has been slain and has purchased us so that we are God's. And we no longer belong to sin and death. And yet there is still more comfort for us. Jesus is not done in being slain to give us a certain future and being slain in order to save us from sin and death. No, we have yet another comfort from the fact that our Lamb has been slain for us. We have the comfort of knowing that this Lamb who has been slain is worthy to rule all of creation. That's the point, isn't it? The point of those last two songs of praise that were sung to this Lamb in this chapter of Revelation chapter 5. Those songs said, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. What a comfort it is for you and I to stop and to realize that the God who has all power and all authority, this is the God who laid down his life as an innocent lamb and was slain for us. The one who rules all things and who rules all things for all eternity. He is the one who out of his love laid down his life. And so he rules all things out of that great love for us. He rules them for our good. Truly Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And today at the foot of the cross, we see that Lamb of God slain for us. And yet through the sorrow of that death, we see the great comfort that is ours. The comfort of knowing that that lamb was slain in order to give us a certain hope in heaven. That lamb was slain to give us the comfort of knowing that we have been purchased from sin and death and now belong to God. That lamb that has been slain gives us the comfort of knowing that he rules all things out of his great love for us. God grant that you and I would cling to that comfort of knowing that our lamb has been slain for us. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus and life everlasting. Amen.